Hi, early American literature friends. This video is a short guide to three chapters from Harriet Jacobs. Chapter one, childhood. Chapter seven, the lover. And chapter 10, a perilous passage. Um, I'm gonna try to give you some introduction information about Harriet Jacobs and then go through those three chapters and then uh, pick out the important moments in those chapters that she talks about, both in terms of physical violence, but also her sort of like growing awareness of her situation and then resistance, uh, her resistance to Dr. Flint and the way that he's sexually harassing her and harassing her in any number of other ways as well. Um, you see Harriet Jacobs here. She was born um, in sometime, we're not exactly certain, between 1813 and 1815. The documentation on that on her birth is not totally clear, in part because of the circumstances that she describes in the beginning, where she's born to her mother. Uh, her father is in this situation where he is technically a slave, but he works his own contracts and things like that. Um, which is what she describes in that first chapter, the first uh, childhood chapter. Um, she was born in Edenton, North Carolina, and that is where she lives until she escapes. And later, when she hides for seven years in her grandmother's attic, that all happens in Edenton. Um, Dr. Flint, uh, Dr. Flint, who is the person who technically owns her um, because she is willed to his daughter, uh, he lives, he is a doctor in the town of Edenton. His son has a plantation outside of town, but everything that's that's being described in the chapters that we are reading happens in Edenton until she escapes and goes to upstate New York, to Rochester, New York. If you're not familiar with Edenton, and it's a small town, it's in northeastern uh, North Carolina, close to the coast and coast close to the Virginia border. So like in northeastern North Carolina. Um, she lived a long life, as you can see, she lived to see the end of slavery and she lived to 1897, almost to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, she and her daughter, who she describes in this book later, um, one of her children, lived together for the rest, after they both escaped to the North. Um, she and both of her, both of, after she, while she was hiding in her grandmother's attic, her two children's freedom was purchased by their father, who she describes in just a minute. Um, and she and her brother and her children all eventually escaped. Um, her son and her brother went to work in the um, California Gold Rush later on, um, which later on in the book when she describes them, and you, if you're wondering where um, her son is, he has already gone to California to be a part of the California Gold Rush. But she lived a long time. Um, after the Civil War, like I said, until 1897. But we'll jump in here. Uh, incidents in the life of the slave girl has come to be put beside narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass as the two most important um, slave narratives in American literature. You get one by a man, Frederick Douglass, and then this one by a woman, Harriet Jacobs. Um, and she, she has this unique situation, which also explains, much like Frederick Douglass has a situation with being sent to Baltimore, she has a unique um, situation, which is how she becomes literate. She talks about how she was born a slave. I never knew it. I'm gonna jump over here to the actual text itself. Uh, I was born a slave, but I never knew it till six years of happy childhood had passed away. So she gives you the first six years of her life. She essentially has no concept of her situation as a slave. My father was a carpenter and considered so intelligent and skillful in his trade that when buildings out of the common line were to be erected, he was sent for from long distances on condition of paying his mistress $200 a year. This is about if you were a slave, the situation of her father, if you were technically chattel slavery, um, this is about as free as it could get for you. Her father pays the first $200 that he makes every year to his owner and then he is free to do whatever he wants as long as, but he has to provide for himself. Supporting himself, he was allowed to work at his trade and manage his own affairs. Um, his strongest wish was to purchase his children, but though he several times offered his hard earnings, he never succeeded. She also gives you, much like Frederick Douglass in the first chapter of Douglass's book, she gives you this description of her, her um, color. In complexion, my parents were a light shade of brownish yellow and were termed mulattoes. They lived in a comfortable, comfortable home. That we were all slaves, I was finally shielded. She talks about her brother who comes into play later. Um, 
the sort of light skin is important to her because much like for the same reason it's important to Frederick Douglass to sort of mix genealogy her if you think back to Frederick Douglass's point that the, these this generation of slaves is looks very different than the people who originally brought over from Africa she's making a similar point here by bringing this up and she will later say like oh the mixed genealogies of slavery and things like that uh, she also talks in the in that first paragraph she tells this story that is easy to miss if you're not if if you're not sort of keyed in and understanding what has happened her grandmother who she later describes in the book uh was freed you see right there she was the daughter of a planter in south carolina who at his death left her mother and his three children free with money to go to saint augustine where they had relatives what what she describes right here it was during the revolutionary war they were captured on their passage carried back and sold to different purchasers is that her grandmother and her grandmother's children were freed, but the only thing that they had to prove that they had been freed was document was hard paperwork documentation. They are sent to St. Augustine, which at that point um, would have been British, and the British had ended slavery by this point. And so they she is being sent to a place where she would be free, both in terms of paperwork and because slavery has ceased to exist in, in the British colonies. But she is intercepted or captured, and the free papers are done away with, and she is sold back into slavery in North Carolina, which is how her grandmother ends up in Edenton. She was a little girl when she was captured and sold to the keeper of a large hotel. That, that gets you to Harriet Jacobs' mother, grandmother, mother, and the situation that they are in. Um, you also get this description of her grandmother's cooking she became an indispensable personage in the household, officiating in all capacities from cook and wet nurse to seamstress. She was much praised for her cooking and her nice crackers became so famous in the neighborhood that many people were desirous of obtaining them. So she, much like Harriet Jacobs' father, her grandmother cooks at night to make extra money and save up money and try to buy, the free, um, buy freedom for her children, something that she never succeeds in doing. Um, my grandmother remained in her service as a slave, but her children were divided among her master's children. As she had five, Benjamin, the youngest one, was sold in order that each heir might have an equal portion of dollars and cents. Um, this is Harriet, Harriet Jacobs' grandmother's owner. The husband dies, they, they have four kids, and the grandmother has five kids, so they sell off one of the children and split it up. Harriet Jacobs uses this as an example of sort of the horrors of slavery um, that they're not even in the owner's eyes they're not even people so they have to they just are people that have, they just have to be evenly divided like property uh his say and she even says his sale was a terrible blow to my grandmother um such was and then you jump to that second paragraph such were the unusually for unfortunate circumstances of my early, early childhood when i was six years old my mother died and for the first time i learned by the talk around me that i was a slave um, and so her mother dies when she's six years old. There is this sort of discussion both among the owners and among like people like her grandmother about what's gonna happen to her. Um, the, and the best outcome for her is what happens. Obviously your mother dying is not a great outcome, but under the circumstances, I was told that my home was now to be with her mistress. So she basically takes her mother's place as the servant to her, to her mistress. I found it a happy one. No toilsome or disagreeable duties were imposed upon me. My mistress was so kind to me that I was always glad to do her bidding and proud to labor for her. Um, she, I would sit by her side for hours, sewing diligently with a heart as free from care as that of any freeborn white child. And when she thought I was tired, she would send me out to run and jump, and I, away I bounded to gather berries or flowers to decorate her room. So you get the first six years of her life until her mother dies. And then she has essentially six more years serving her mother's miss, serving what had been her mother's mistress as a sort of hand, handmaid, um, maid. But then she jumps you to that next paragraph. When I was nearly 12 years old, so you got six years and then six more years, my kind mistress sickened and died. Um, and there is much discussion about how Harriet Jacobs hopes that she's going to be set free now that her mistress has died. Kind of like what happened with her grandmother. On the death of her mistress, she will be set free. Instead, that paragraph that begins, after a brief period of suspense, the will of my mistress was read. We learned that she had bequeathed me to her sister's daughter, a child of five years old. <laughs> so she is willed to 
the mistress's niece, the, the mistress's sister's daughter. Um, and that is how she ends up in the family of Dr. Flint. She is willed to a child who is five years old. And obviously a five-year-old cannot own property, so she is technically the property of that child's father, who is Dr. Flint. Dr. Flint becomes an important figure in this book, um, and this gives you the sense of how she ends up with Dr. Flint. The um, five-year-old, the niece, eventually comes back later in the book, so don't totally forget about her. But, it, but for our immediate purposes, she is now the property of Dr. Flint and his wife. Um, and she, uh, much like Frederick Douglass does at the bottom of that paragraph, Harriet Jacobs gives you this quote of scripture. My mistress had taught me the precepts of God's words. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Whatsoever ye would that men would do unto you, do you even unto them. She quotes that because she says like, you know, even Christian slave owners who say they believe in Christianity, they don't apply it to themselves and to their interactions with slavery. Uh, while I was with her, she taught me to read and spell, and for this privilege, which so rarely falls to the lot of slaves, I bless her memory. There she gives you the, she is the rare slave who knows how to read and write, and she explains to you how she got that skill before her mistress died. She taught her to read and write. She taught her to read and, read and write. Um, that chapter ends with the, um, her description, she possessed but few slaves, and at her death, they were all distributed among the relatives. She gives you this description again of the um, five of them were my mother's grandchildren. Um, not one of her children escaped the auction block. And so again, she says, these God-breathing machines are no more in the sight of their masters than the cotton they plant or the horses they tent. This description of how slaves are just treated as property, um, not God-breathing machines. Uh, what she, her argument that if these people were truly Christian and practiced what they preached, they would recognize African Americans as God breathing machines is just as human and as deserving of freedom as themselves. You jump, she gives you that description of her childhood and you jump forward a few years into chapter seven, uh, which is called the lover. Why does the slave ever, and that chapter begins, why does the slave ever love? Why does the, why allow the tendrils of the heart to twine around objects which may at any moment be wrenched away by a hand of violence? Harriet Jacobs is somewhere around 13, 14 years old in this chapter. And this is the chapter that is often referred to as the first love chapter. She falls in love. Um, the chapter is called The Lover and she falls in love with a free black carpenter, a carpenter much like her dad. Um, this is, but she gives you um, her description. One of the things she does in this chapter is give you this description of how you can't judge slave women, slave women, and she means slave women in particular by the same standards that you would judge other women because she wants to talk about how this is her first love. It's this sort of pure form of love because it's her first love, but the she has denied the ability to follow it um, because slavery is the barrier in her way. Um, youth will be youth. I loved and I indulged the hope that the dark clouds around me would turn out a bright lining. Um, and that's in that first chapter. There was in the neighborhood a young colored carpenter, a freeborn man. We had been well acquainted in childhood, frequently met together. We became mutually attached. He proposed to marry me. I loved him with all the ardor of a young girl's first love. There's that where she's bringing out that like young girl's first love. Um, but when I reflected that I was a slave and that the laws gave no sanction to the marriage as such, my heart sank within me. My lover wanted to buy me, but I knew that Dr. Flint was too willful and arbitrary a man to consent to that arrangement. So she knows that Dr. Flint will not sell her because he wants her for himself. Dr. Flint wants to break her down. He's been, he's already been sexually harassing her since the moment that he got her when she was a 12 year old girl. So there's obviously like multiple layers of just disgusting awfulness here. This sort of abuse of a minor child, sexual harassment of a minor child, and, you know, sexual coercion of a slave. Um, Harry Jacobs talks about the various problems and concerns that she has. Like, again, if she married this free man and they had children, the children would be slaves so that her husband wouldn't have any ability to protect them. Many and anxious, many and anxious were the thoughts are evolved in my mind. I was at a loss what to do. I was desirous to spare my lover the insults that had cut so deeply into my soul. I talked with my grandmother about it and partly told her my fears. There was a, and then you get that paragraph, this love dream had been my support through many trials. She tries to get a third party, a, a family friend to talk to Dr. Flynn about um, having her, the lover by her, the person that she's in love with. 
I ventured to suggest that perhaps my mistress would approve of me being sold. Um, Dr. Flint does not go along with this plan. He finally confronts her. So you want to be married, do you? Yes, sir. Well, I'll convince you whether I am your master. Um, and they have this confrontation. This is an interesting confrontation um, because you get her reply. Um, she says, I, I replied, if he is a puppy, if, if he is a puppy, I am a puppy, for we are both of the Negro race. It is right and honorable for us to love each other. The man you call a puppy never insulted me. She's obviously saying like you would. And he would not love me if he did not me, believe me to be a virtuous woman. He sprang upon me like a tiger and gave me a stunning blow. It was the first time he had ever struck me. This is an important moment in this book because there's not a lot of physical violence in this book. It's just not described that much. And Harry Jacobs does not care to describe it in graphic detail like Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass over and over again shows you these just graphic images of violence, people being whipped, people being beaten, the fight with Mr. Covey, all those things like that. Harry Jacobs is just not interested in that. There's not a lot of physical violence in this book. And when she tells you about it, she does not get graphic about it. She says, oh, he hit me. It's the first time he hit, and you know, she, she remembers it's the first time he hit me and she makes note of that. But you do not get these graphic physical descriptions of violence because that's not what she's interested in. What she cares more about is the ongoing harassment and s sexual harassment and antagonism that Dr. Flynn is acting out on her year over year over year. Uh, so he hits her um, and then he blames her for driving him to it, for hitting her. Um, they argue some more. He says, silence, he exclaimed in a thundering voice. By heaven, girl, you forget you forget yourself too far. Um, and you get that D Dr. Flynn is going back and forth with her. Um, the argument there and the physical violence ends with him telling her to never mention him again, never mention the lover again. Um, and you get that, par that interesting paragraph where she says, reader, did you ever hate? I hope not. I never did but once. And so she tells you she's only ever hated one person, obviously, Dr. Flint. And I trust I never shall again. Somebody has called it the atmosphere of hell, and I believe it is so. Then she and Dr. Flint don't talk for two weeks. For a fortnight, the doctor did not speak to me after they had this big argument about her wanting to marry this guy. Um, she says Dr. Flint's always got an eye on her. No animal ever watched his prey more narrowly than he watched me. He knew that I could write, though he had failed to make me read his letters. Um, Dr. Flint comes up with this plan to take her and several other slaves to Louisiana so he can be alone with her and, and sexually assault her. Um, she doesn't want to go. The plan doesn't work out because his son comes back from Louisiana and is like, no, we shouldn't do this. Um, Summer passed away, and early in the autumn, Dr. Flint's eldest son was sent to Louisiana. There's the, like, the son goes to Louisiana. The plan doesn't work out. Young Mr. Flint did not bring back a favorable report of Louisiana. I heard no more of that scheme. Soon after this, my lover met me at the corner of the street, and I stopped to speak to him. Looking up, I saw my master watching us from the window. So Dr. Flint catches her talking to the lover again. He met me with a blow. When is mistress to be married, he said in a sneering tone. And so he hits her and then makes fun of her for, you know, talking to this person who, he, who Dr. Flint came to prevent her from marrying. How thankful I was that my lover was a free man, that my tyrant had no power to flog him for speaking to me in the street. And at the end of this chapter, Harriet Jacobs finally tells the person, the man that she's in love with, he's, she, she says, look, he's never going to let you buy me. I'm never going to be free. This is not going to work out. And so he leaves town uh, to go to Savannah to settle some property. And she tells him, like, look, don't come back. Don't wait for me because this isn't going to work out. Um, still, I was not stripped of all. The, and she says... With, the, with me, the lamp of hope had gone out. The dream of my girlhood was over. The sort of like dream of falling in love and, and marrying the person, the, your first love. I felt lonely and desolate. And then that last paragraph. Still, I was not stripped of all. I still had my good grandmother and my affectionate brother. Um, and that last paragraph tells you that her comfort, she still has comfort, especially from her grandmother, but also from her younger brother, Benjamin. Um, as for my grandmother, she was strongly opposed to her children's un undertaking any such project. She had not forgotten poor Benjamin's suffering. She was afraid that if another child tried to escape, he would have a, have a similar or worse fate. To me, nothing seemed more dreadful than my present life. I said to myself, William must be free. That's her younger brother. And so she, here she is thinking, she is already thinking it, when she's like an adolescent or young teenager, she's thinking about escape. Her grandmother doesn't want anybody to try to run away and escape. And her grandmother never does. She stays there. Um, 
but Harry Jacobs, you can all, you can tell already, is thinking about escaping, and at the very least, getting her brother to her younger brother to freedom, even if she can't escape. You jump from there uh, to chapter ten, uh, a perilous passage in the slave girl's life. This is the real turning point in this book. As much as later, she runs away from the plantation, from Dr. Flint's son's plantation, and hides in the attic for seven years. But this is, most of the time when people read this book, you can feel her hit this crisis point. Because this chapter begins with Dr. Flint deciding that the way that he can finally get what he wants, which is to rape Harriet Jacobs, um, the way that he can get what he wants is to build her a house, what he calls a cottage, right outside of town where nobody can hear her, you know, screaming for help or resisting being physically assaulted, sexually assaulted. So he decides that he's going to build this cottage for her outside of town under the guise of like being nice to her and building a house for her. Um, but once he announces that he is going to do this, Harriet Jacobs has to take desperate measures. After my lover went away, Dr. Flint contrived a new plan. He seemed to have an idea that my fear of my mistress, that would be Dr. Flint's wife, Mrs. Flint, was his greatest obstacle. He told me he was going to build a small house for me in a secluded place four miles away from town far enough outside of town that nobody could hear her screaming for help or, or being raped. Um, I shuddered, but I was constrained to listen. Hitherto, I had escaped my dreaded fate by being in the midst of people. Well, there you go. She had escaped being sexually assaulted and raped because she was always near people. Other people would hear her screaming for help, hear it happening. Um, I vowed before my maker that I would never enter it. She, she makes this sort of promise to God that she will never enter the house. Uh, I was determined that the master whom I so hated and loathed who had blighted the prospects of my youth should not, after my long struggle, succeed in trampling his victims, uh, succeed at last in trampling his vi victim under his feet. And now, reader, I come to a period in my unhappy life which I would gladly forget if I could. The remembrance fills me with sorrow and shame. It pains me to tell you of it. And so she, she tells you that she's about to tell you something, sorrow and shame. She's about to confess something that she's ashamed of. Neither can I plead ignorance or thoughtlessness. For years, my master had done his utmost to pollute my mind. And that had made me prematurely knowing concerning the evil ways of the world. This is about as dirty as you could get in the 1800s. She's very clearly talking about sex. But, oh, ye happy women whose purity has been sheltered from childhood, do not judge the poor, desolate slave girl too severely. This is an important moment because she is thinking about the people who would be reading this book and the white women, especially, who would be reading this book. And she's trying to appeal to them and say, look, you know, I, I tried to stay pure just like you tried to stay pure in this sort of cult of true womanhood, um, domesticness uh, that was really important in the 1800s. And she said, look, but slavery took it away from me. Slavery wouldn't let me be with the person I wanted. And I had, and I had to give in and have sex before marriage um, to protect myself from being raped in Dr. Flint's cottage. And I've told you that Dr. Flint's persecutions and his wife's jealousy had given rise to some gossip it chanced that a white unmarried gentleman had obtained some knowledge of the circumstances in which I was placed. He constantly sought opportunities to see me, wrote to me frequently, and I was a poor slave girl, only 15 years old. So much attention from a superior person was, of course, flattering, for human nature is the same in all. And gradually, by degrees, a more tender feeling crept into my heart. Of course, I knew whether this was all tending. I knew the impassable gulf between us. But to be an object of interest to a man who is not married and who is not her master is agreeable to the pride and feelings of a slave. It seems less degrading to give oneself than to submit to compulsion. There's something akin to freedom in having a lover who has no control over you. There may be sophistry in all this, but the condition of a slave confuses all principles of morality. That's an important idea for her, that slavery confuses morality. Just like Frederick Douglass, she understands slavery as this poison that poisons everything, including morality and ethics. Um, and so what she describes in this chapter is she, her plan to resist going to the cottage um, is that she has an affair um, with a man whose, um, his actual name is Samuel Sawyer, but in the book she calls him Mr. Sands. He is a lawyer in town. She has an affair with him. She eventually has two children with him. But what she is describing here is the first, getting pregnant with that first child when she is 15 years old, and then she, she is pregnant when she's 15, then has the child when she's 16 years old. <clears throat> and she talks um, in that long paragraph that begins, when I found that my master had actually begun to build the lonely cottage, other feelings mixed with those I have described. 
revenge, and calculations of interest were added to flattered vanity. I knew nothing would enrage Dr. Flint so much as to know that I had favored another. And so she's also thinking, like, Dr. Flint's going to find out I'm pregnant by somebody else, and he's going to be jealous, and I'm going to have my revenge on him that way, too. So getting pregnant will prevent me from being sent to the cottage, and it will make Dr. Flint jealous and angry. The months passed on. I had many unhappy hours. As for Dr. Flint, I had the feeling of satisfaction and triumph in the thoughts of telling him. At last, he came and told me the cottage was completed. I told him I would never enter it. Um, he said, I have heard enough of such talk. You shall go if you're carried by force. And this is when she plays her card. She says, I will never go there because in a few months I shall be a mother. He stood and looked at me in dumb amazement. And Dr. Flint is just dumbstruck. She can't believe, Dr. Flint can't believe that not only has she had sex with someone else, that his plan to, to force her into a sexual relationship has failed, but she is pregnant with somebody else in the cottage. It's all for nothing. But... She is then immediately confronted with the problem, which is now that Dr. Flint knows, now that the secret is out, she's also going to have to tell her grandmother, um, who is her closest, who is like a mother figure to her since her mother died when she was six years old. She's going to have to tell, let her grandmother know that like she has gotten pregnant out of marriage, something that her mother never did. And so you get that paragraph that, said, that starts, I went to my grandmother, my lips moved to make confession. And she can't even bring herself to confess what has happened. Um, and Dr. Flint's wife comes in and, and tells, you know, attack, harasses Harriet Jacobs, yells at Harriet Jacobs. Um, and the grandmother finds out. She exclaimed, oh, Linda, that's Harriet Jacobs' pen name in the book. Oh, Linda, has it come to this? I'd rather see you dead than see you as you are now. She tore my from my fingers my mother's wedding ring and her sil silver thimble. The two things that she had to remember that she was willed to her mother that she had to remember her way or remember her mother by go away she exclaimed and never come to my house again her approaches fell so hot and heavy that they left me no chance to answer bitter tears such as the eyes never shed but once were my only answer and so she she gets her revenge on dr flint and her plan works like dr flint is obviously upset that she's favored someone else and has had sex with someone else and he has failed to like force her into a sexual relationship the cottage plan hasn't worked out she's never she's not gonna go to the cottage but the, the it's a double-edged sword because now obviously everybody knows about it you, you can only hide pregnancy for so long and her grandmother knows about it and her grandmother is ashamed that she has had a sexual relationship with somebody outside of wedlock um, the grandmother throws her out of her house where could I go I was afraid to return to my master's I walked on recklessly not caring where I went she finally walks and stays a few nights with a friend of her mother's. My, and my friend advised me to send for her, the grandmother, and I did so. But days of agonizing suspense passed by. Had she utterly forsaken me? No, she came at last. I knelt before her and told her the things that had poisoned my life, how long I had been persecuted. I begged of her to pity me for my dead mother's sake, and she did pity me. She did not say, I forgive you, but she looked at me lovingly with her eyes full of tears. She laid her old hand gently on my head and murmured, poor child, poor child. And so that chapter ends with the secret of Harriet Jacob's first pregnancy coming out. She has gotten pregnant to prevent herself from like being sent to the cabin, to the cottage that Dr. Flynn is building to be, to be sexually assaulted. Um, but the grandmother obviously finds out as well. The grandmother finally forgives her because Harriet Jacobs has tried to like not let her know how much harass, sexual harassment she gets on a day-to-day -day basis. And how Dr. Flynn is constantly writing her dirty notes and trying to get her to do this or do that. Um, so she endures this. One thing that's important to understand about this book is um, she goes to live with Dr. Flint when she's roughly 12 years old. She gets pregnant when she's 15, has her first child when she's 16, gets pregnant again when she's 18, maybe 18, 19, has her second child when she's 19. So they're a couple years apart. And then she... When she's 20, 21, um, runs away and hides in her grandmother's attic for seven years. So we're in the middle of this chronology of her life. Um, she's about 15 right here at the end of this. Um, she lives with her grandmother basically a, a block away from Dr. Flint. Um, you can find maps of where they all live in Edenton uh, online. So they basically live either a block away or their houses like back up to each other. The grandmother's house, the grandmother's little house and Dr. Flint's big sort of what you think of when you think of like Annabella mansions and stuff like that, uh, his house. So this ch chapter 10 ends with her being 
15 or maybe 16, 15, 16, um, and being pregnant, but she has gotten pregnant to prevent herself from being sent to live in the house that Dr. Flint built for her. So he could basically have her alone and isolated and sexually assault her. Um, and the grandmother, you know, shocked that this has happened, but eventually forgive, you know, forgives her, at least understands why she has had to do this. Um, and the grandmother just wants to participate back to like trying to protect her instead of sort of throwing her out. Uh, that's an important moment for Harriet Jacobs because over and over again in Harriet Jacobs, you understand that there is this sense that people can, that slaves and especially women slaves cannot survive on their own. And that what allows them the strength to survive is the strength of community and community relations and community connections, whether that's your children or your parents or your grandparents or your brothers and sisters and things like that, or even your aunts and uncles and things like that that what allows slaves, that what gives slaves the strength to survive and to resist slavery and to even run away at times is that community and the strength of family and the extended family that is community. That's an important idea in Harriet Jacobs. That's something that she emphasizes over the kind of violence that you see over and over again in Frederick Douglass. You know, so much of Frederick Douglass is devoted to this idea that I was special, God chose me to get free. Over and over again in Harriet Jacobs, there is this sense that like, what gives you strength and sustains you and allows you to keep going is the support of your family and your community and things like that. I hope that is helpful for you in understanding chapter one and chapter seven and chapter 10 in Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to be in touch.